Uh, good morning, panel members, and may it please the court. Uh, my name is Benjamin Brown, and uh, I, along with my co-counsel, Julie Wishmeyer from Corlson Brady, represent the appellate U.S. Bank as trustee in this case. Uh, before I begin, Matt, please reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Sure. Thank you. Well, let me ask you something right out of the box. I, I know we have a singular borrower. But we have what appears to be two separate loans going on two separate tracks through two different financial institutions. Yes. And okay. Go ahead. Yes. And essentially, this case arises out of a 2006 uh, refinancing transaction. And in 2006, my client's predecessor, Sinovus Mortgage. Court, uh, originated a approximately $1.4, $1.5 million loan that was intended to pay off and satisfy a 2004 loan uh, also to borrower Paul Jallo. And that prior loan was for $2.3 million. It was actually a, an open ended line of credit. The, the, the payoff is in some mistake. And the title. And that title insurance is going to go to I don't see what you're complaining about. To me, it looks like she should have been some notice to the best bank. And that was completely, but otherwise, it could have been the reason. Well, I think for, for starters, the uh, we've uh, identified and, and asserted in our brief that. Um, that the standard and the pleading standard in this case for asserting a cause of action in negligence is, of course, you know, very simple and very straightforward. And to that end, I think even in our reply brief, we identified the uh, Florida, Su Florida Supreme Court approved forms for you know, vehicular negligence, fall down negligence, and other types of negligence. And of course, it's all very rudimentary. <laughs> And if I can just sort of pick that apart piece by piece. First of all, you know, to the extent, because when we saw the motion for summary judgment, which by the way came in along at an unusual time because the motion was filed before the pleadings were even closed. The motion, the rule, the rule does not necessarily, again, the rule does not forbid, it, but if you do file a premature motion or you do file a motion before the pleadings are closed, the heightened burden applies. And have they answered? Have they answered? Well, they, they did. I know this did file an answer to, 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 so to which they could file a motion for trial, then. correct? It's an issue. Well, one, once the pleadings are closed, once yeah, the reply is filed, the trial, but they file once, once the reply is filed, okay. It, but to, to answer your other question, um, yes, we asserted multiple causes of action against multiple parties. However, you know, one thing that we make clear throughout our pleadings and we attempted to make clear to the trial court at the summary judgment hearing and thereafter was that we only asserted one cause of action against Sonovus Bank, and that was for negligence. We never alleged the existence of a contract with Sonovus Bank. And, and that is the, you know, a chasm of difference between, you know, several lines of cases that are argued, you know, in the briefs, you know, the Tank Tech case, uh, the, um, the Peebles versus Pewitt case, because you know, from our perspective, we only had that that uh, singular um, you know cause of action in negligence or tort. Are you, know, you a third party beneficiary of this agreement? Of, of which agreement? Of the first mortgage, correct? Of the of the of Jalos, uh, two point. You're arguing that Smokes had a duty to pay off the first mortgage, correct? Yes, a step okay. a step so to you a beneficiary of that contract between Sonovus and Dow. Well, we're not asserting that. And well, even if even if we did, 
even if we did hypothetically, the, the loan documents between Jalo and Sinovus are only uh, an obligation to, to pay a debt. I'm not, it, 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 it would not, I mean, be effectively, we would be a recipient of additional funds if we were an intended third party beneficiary. The, uh, well, I, I think for, for starters, I don't believe that issue was briefed um, by, you know, by Sinovus or uh, argued by Sinovus at any, at any point in time. But the, the, what, it, what it boils down to is that Sinovus, you know, points to you know, the independent tort doctrine and says, oh, this is barred by contract. But the, the case law that stands for that proposition, you know, the, the Peebles versus Pewin case, which is you know, very distinguishable, it applies in situations where it's the same party with whom you have a contract. If you have, you know, if A has a contract with B, A can't sue B in tort for a wrong that is covered by the contract. That's exactly what Peebles versus Pewick is all about. Okay, well, so you eliminate that, but of the other reasons you point out, but, but then you still have to explain what gives rise to the duty of the breach of the matter. There's no contract, or so there's no contract, therefore, this isn't barred by the independent court doctrine or non gloss or whatever. So, so, so where, where does the duty arise? Well, the duty to arise, uh, at, you know, for instance, first of all, on summary judgment, this is a this is a, a summary judgment case decided under the, the old standard, the uh, the scintilla standard, and it was Sinovus's, you know, burden and duty to show, you know, you know, to the summary judgment standard that that no duty uh, of that law could exist. They did not do that, and it was. You know, and we had indicated in our pleadings, which you know our reply even indicated the exact statute, but 70103 and 70104. Well, that, but that that is wrong. That duty is doesn't exist between in, in, in the relationship that these two parties, the US Bank and Sonova side. That, that duty is a more a more I mean it's right, a mortgage, a mortgage or has the right. Against some word G. I would, I would that's, that's not the relationship. I, I would I would disagree with that. Um, and, and, and here's why 70103 and 70104, when you look at them, first of all, the plain language. The plain language of the rule does not limit their application to, to any you know class of person or persons. It does not limit their application to a mortgagor, that is the borrower. It, um, and the way that 70103 and 70104 are set up, 70103 is essentially one that is, now I, I would concede this, 70103 is drafted in a way where it, it is more for the benefit of the borrower or the mortgagor, because it says that, you know, upon full payment, that the lender, uh, the mortgagee has an obligation to cancel the instrument. That would be the note, you know, that's for the protection of the borrower. I, I would agree that, that 70103 is more for the protection of the borrower, and that's why I'm sort of pivot to 70104. 70104 is, is much broader, and again, the plain language of 70103 and 70104 makes it clear that the class of persons protected um, but is not limited in any way. But 70104, I'm having a hard time understanding how that gives rise to a duty to a stranger to one big transaction. Well, 70104, and again, the reason that there's not just one statute and then there's two, 70104 is set up and separated from 70103 because 70103 is more for the benefit of the borrower and the cancellation of the note. 70104 is about the cancellation of the mortgage in the official land records. This is about the protection of parties you know, who may be inspecting the, 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 the public records at large. And this is to prevent, you know, you know, third parties from coming along and claiming, you know, BFP status. You know, that's what 70104 is about. And that's why there's a requirement that there's the satisfaction that's recorded in the public records, um, you know, within 60 days. And, you know, incidentally, too, and I know that this was briefed, but we know that this was an issue with home equity lines of credit in particular because in 2016, Florida legislature changed the statute 
they changed the statute to accept out home equity lines of credit or lines of credit mortgage. But at a particular point in time, that is 2006, the prior version of the statute applied and a statutory duty that was not limited to any class of person or persons was present on the, uh, on the, the, the Florida statute books, which would have obligated Sonova's bank to pay off and satisfy that line of credit mortgage of record. And right. it, it probably sh shades into the statute of limitations. I don't necessarily want to go to statute of limitations, but the fact is you knew that it had not been satisfied of record. I'm not sure that had not yet that hadn't been established. Okay. That okay. hadn't been established. Um, and again. I won't belabor the record and how exactly the motion came about, but again, the, the motion was filed without any supporting evidence. Um, well, so, you know, we're going to assume for purposes of their motion, the summary judgment motion, that everything in the complaint is true. And maybe it's more akin to a motion on the pleading or something, but that means that the, we're accepting uh, the facts of the complaint. Understood. And, and that is even considering Sonova's bank denied, you know, the vast majority of, al of, of allegations in the complaint. But, but you know, under that you know assumption in, you know, in review, there's there's no question here in this case that Sonova's received all of the money from the closing, one point, you know, over one point four million dollars. They admit that they received it. I mean, that actually was an admitted allegation. Then, in, in between the time they filed their motion and the time of the, the uh, the telephonic hearing during COVID, you know, we took a number of depositions, you know, several, uh, with three representatives of Sonova's bank. And um, you know, one of the individuals testified that although a payment history was unavailable for inexplicable reasons, the payment history should have been available because the loan was sold later. That's normally something that's, uh, you know, required or provided along with the, um, you know, the, the loan sale. But the transaction journal or ledger was available, and it showed that at the relevant time, my, my client's predecessor's money was paid, was paid in, received, paid the loan down to zero, and the loan remained at zero for approximately ten months. Is so, that a legal duty? So um, it could have been a well, still, in their answer, denied the legal duty, and argued they did not have the legal duty. Well, but well, they're not snowed. The answer is yes. From, from our this perspective, is a legal issue? well, I guess a, a few different pieces to, to unpack there. I agree that the existence of a legal duty is and so a deposition of somebody trying to recall based on the lack of records that are trying to recall something so that they pay it off. Well, I, I think that, that it, it, it goes a little. You know, past the issue of duty. You know, I believe that the duty, you know, is set, you know, by virtue of 70104. And quite frankly, well, you didn't make a written request for the uh, buy a mortgage loan. That's a condition precedent. If you file a lawsuit under 70104, you got to that's a condition precedent for included with one of which is subsection one within 14 days of written request by a mortgage. You didn't do that. You haven't done that in this case. Well, I, I, guess, I mean, that's the first sentence. Well, and again, there's, I guess, a couple of different you know, issues there. Is, you know, number one, you know, that, that was not an argument that was ever advanced by Sonova's Bank in its motion or in the hearing or, or, or in its brief. Well, um, how did you comply with 7104? Well, in, we filed an, an action in negligence right. citing 70104 right. as the relevant right. standard. Alleged was no bank had a duty to properly apply funds to pay off those assigned by the prime mortgage. You don't sign something and you will choose the thing. Well, and we, and from our perspective, we didn't need to for, for the reasons I mentioned before, in terms of what the pleading standard is in Florida. I believe we, we addressed this most carefully in our reply brief. Um, you know, about the, the, the bar is low in terms of what is required in order to state a cause of action for negligence. 
you know, erring on the side of caution after after seeing Synovus's motion for summary judgment, where they highlighted that there's no duty owed to Synovus or that uh, et cetera, something along those lines. You know, we, we even filed out of caution a motion for leave to amend complaint along with a proposed third amended complaint with buttressed and fortified and, and clarified provisions regarding duty and you know you know from and to and I believe that that was filed um sometime between June 29th and the time of the hearing August 25th. Mr. Brown let me interrupt you for a moment. Uh you're a little bit over over 15 minutes into your argument. It's your time use it as you wish but you want to give you a heads up. Yes. Um, well, I'll just finish up with this issue and then um, I'll, I'll reserve the remaining time for both. But the bottom line is, uh, so number one, from our perspective, we adequately stated a cause of action for negligence in our second amended complaint. Second of all, um, we even filed a motion for leave to amend the complaint and attached a proposed third amended complaint with fortified, buttressed, clarified provisions regarding duties. Um, in, 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 in response to this potential argument by Synovus that duties were not adequately pled. Um, at the hearing, I believe in, in the transcript, uh, the judge made it clear that this was not a pleading issue, the pleadings were fine. And then in the judge's summary judgment uh, order, not the final judgment, but the summary judgment order, um, Judge Allen also you know, reiterated that this was not a technical pleading issue. And again, I believe that you know, to the extent there ever was a pleading issue, we, you know, we protected ourselves and the court could have and should have uh, denied the motion and granted us that leave to amend, you know, and allowed us to plead with the third amended complaint, but we never even needed to because the court, um, you know, decided that our pleadings were adequate, um, you know, with respect to the negligence cause of action. Is that really what she found? Because the court can simply say that the pleadings are after for me to make a rule as opposed to the pleadings are legally insufficient. And Judge Allen said, the argument is for me before the court is not a technical pleading issue. She fully understood that you had no contractual relationship with the client and you owe no duty to the client under the circumstances led by the client. So so it looks to me like Judge Allen reviewed the pleadings and specific allegations and found that you did not establish the pleadings based on the totality of the pleadings. And, and I, I, I think I, I think I agree with you insofar that Judge Allen found that that there was no legal duty, that there was no pleading issue. I think I mean, in my understanding and in my reading of of her ruling was that we adequately pled everything we needed to plead, but she simply found that under the circumstances that there was no legal duty of, of, um, uh, you know, you know, of Synovus Bank you know, to um, pay off or satisfy the mortgage under the circumstances. So with that, I'll leave my remaining time for you. Yeah, we'll give you three minutes in the bottle. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Brown. Um, may it please the court, my name is Nicole D. Seelin, and I'm here on behalf of Synovus uh, Bank. Uh, I think you know, this panel has asked several questions about duty, and I think Judge Allen's order is very clear that she found that there was no duty. Um, she did analyze it in the context of 70104, as well as more of the common law duty and specifically uh, found that there was no relationship between the parties in contract or otherwise. And I think that that is consistent with the prior case law that says in these situations where there's purely economic losses, that there has to be that relationship or an extraordinary circumstance. And that wasn't present here. Um, in fact, Judge LaRose brought up at the very beginning, these are two separate transactions kind of running parallel, right? Um, for purposes of our transactions, our successors and in interests were Mills and Crescent Oaks. For purposes of the appellant's transaction, 
it was following Zenova's mortgage corp, which isn't relate, was not a related party. So these were two separate transactions, not even in the same row, for lack of a better word. Um, I think that Judge Allen also said it well, and I've got her highlighted here. She stated that um, in, in ruling on the issue of duty, that it would be a generalized never ending duty to any subsequent holder of a mortgage on real property if she found a duty in this case. Plaintiff's negligence claim, if allowed to proceed, would essentially make Snow as a title insurer for any party having a subsequent interest in the party, either as an owner or mortgage. And I think that spoke volumes about that issue of duty. Um, but as we discussed, there were three separate bases for the order, and Judge Allen found that there was no duty, and you can affirm on any one of the three. But there's also a statute of limitations issue, and we haven't really discussed that issue yet. Um, as Judge Allen found, she determined that the statute of limitations began to accrue in March of 2014. There was an attachment to the complaint and it was an email from uh, the appellant to the title insurer and it stated, a review of title reveals an open senior HELOC in favor of Mills 2011 LLC by virtue of assignment of mortgage. It then demands coverage and indemnification under the title policy. Judge Allen determined that that March 2014 email was when, at a minimum, the statute of limitations accrued because they knew they knew they were damaged. Now, there's been extensive focus on in the briefing regarding concepts of professional negligence, and in those cases where this court and other courts, quite frankly have allowed that to be extended in certain circumstances, particularly in cases involving lawyers and an accountant, right? Judge Allen determined correctly that those cases didn't apply here. And I think she relied on two cases that I believe are really important. One of them was Keller Mayor, which is uh, 427 Southern 2nd 343 from the first DCA. That court in that case found that the party suffered damages. And it was very similar, as similar as you can get case. They determined that the party suffered damages when the funds were diverted, not when the priority of mortgages was determined, which is what the appellant has argued here. Their argument is we didn't have damage until the lower court or in this Crescent Oaks foreclosure, the subsequent foreclosure action, until they said your loan is second and we're foreclosing. And in Keller Mayor, the, the court said, although the exact amount of damages may not have been established until the foreclosure action, the statute begins to run when there is injury, however slight, even if the full extent of the injury is unknown. And it says that when that loan was impaired by the fact that it was second or whatever the case may be, that's the damage. There's an immediate diminution in the value of that mortgage because of being no longer being first. And it didn't require the foreclosure action in that case. And in this case, it doesn't require the foreclosure action. In March of 14, appellant knew that this action, that there was an unsatisfied or at least an open HELOC that previously had been associated with us. There was damage. Now, ultimately the foreclosure court determined that their loan was second and foreclosed their interest. That may have impacted the amount of damages, but that there was already damage. So I think um, the concept that I wanted to focus on is that it had not been previously focused on was this concept of the statute of limitations. If it accrued in March of 14, that statute of limitations ran in 2018. This action was not filed until June of 2019. So it was filed beyond the four year statute of limitations that are applicable to negligence actions. Um, the other concept, and this court did discuss the concept of duty. Um, just briefly, I want to focus on a couple of those issues. Um, I believe that Judge Allen's order was correct in the regard that she found that they um, there was no duty. Uh, she did state it was not a technical pleading deficiency, and she did go ahead and analyze a 70103 and 70104. Now, the, obviously, there's extensive, also extensive briefing on this issue. 
the, the appellant in this case was obligated to plead ultimate facts that supported their claim for relief. Their argument is we didn't need to plead this statutory basis to form to get the relief under the statute. Um, I disagree. Now, they have stated and they've compared it to comparable automobile accidents. And they say, you were in an automobile accident. You don't have to plead the statute that creates this duty under automobile law, right? That's the argument. My point is you have to plead the relationship of the parties in order to plead the duty. If that duty is created by a statute, that should be pled. That duty in that statute, this court found in Shelton, which Judge Allen cited to, this court actually discussed 70104. And it said, and this was the Washington Mutual Bank v. Shelton from 2005, the rule of strict construction has been specifically applied to section 70104. Under such strict construction, 70104 would apply only to the mortgagor. Further, even were the statute extended to a junior lienor who pays off the first mortgage, the Sheltons make no contention that they did not obtain a timely estoppel, et cetera, et cetera. And then it goes on to further discuss 70104. Now, there's also a third DCA opinion, and that was cited in our uh, motion for re or opposition to the motion for rehearing. And it's Laptop Plaza Inc. v. Wells Fargo Bank. And the court stated in regard to Section 70104, there is little doubt that Florida recognizes such a separate and discreet cause of action by a borrower against a lender. Undoubtedly, in this case, appellant is not a borrower. There was no allegation of the conditions precedent having been satisfied in the complaint. There was no allegation that 704, 70104 was even at play until they filed the reply. Now, I do want to make the comment because this came up in the briefing as well. Um, in the reply to our affirmative defenses, there was an assertion under that the first time that we saw 70103 and 70104 mentioned but it doesn't mention duty. It says, defendant failed to lessen the risk to plaintiff and failed to take the necessary precautions in order to protect plaintiff from harm and damages. And they cite C, 70103 and 70104, but there's no mention of duty. So then they argue, well, that's not our fault that you didn't know. Well, it is because there's obligations under the pleading rules to plead the ultimate facts. And if the basis of the duty in this case is statutory, they had an obligation to indicate so. Now, Judge Allen didn't go there. She found it just didn't work here. She just found it didn't apply. So this court could affirm on that basis, or it could affirm under the grounds of the statutes of a statute of limitations um, that Judge Allen determined. Um, there's also the issue of the independent tort doctrine. Um, this court has uh, indicated in uh, prior questioning that it believes that there does have to be contractual privity. I will I will inform this court that in the Peebles v. Quig case, which is the case that was relied upon by Judge Allen, there was not contractual privity. Um, the parties in that case, it was a contract between Quig and then two entities called PADC and Collins Avenue. Uh, Quig sued for breach of contract against these entities and then also sued a woman named Peebles for the same damages. Peebles did work for one of those entities, but the contract wasn't with her. So there was no contractual privity between those entities. Nonetheless, the court said that because the damages that were being sought by the contractual relief were the same as the tort damages, that the independent tort doctrine controlled. And that's the case that's cited by Judge Allen in her order. Um, for what, for where that's headed. <laughs> um, the other points, I don't know if um, your honors want me to highlight any of these issues, but I know that they discussed our reliance on the summary judge on the complaint as the merits of the complaint on the truth of the complaint. And we did not provide any summary judgment evidence. Um, I believe that the rules clearly state that you're allowed to do that. In fact, in the Green case from the first DCA, first DCA in 1993, an unsworn complaint 
must be accepted as true for purposes of the motion for summary judgment unless conclusively disproven. We opted to accept that it was the truth for the purposes of our argument. And so um, there was that. There was also a discussion in the briefing about discovery issues that remained, out, uh, remained pending at the time of the hearing. Um, and I believe these issues have been fully briefed for the court, but I wanted to make a, a quick point on that. Um, there was not a request to continue this motion for summary judgment when it was set for hearing. Um, there, I did cite several cases in the brief that dealt with that. There's nothing in the rule that specifically said that at the time, but the case laws repeat with examples. Um, subsequent to filing my brief, I found additional case law that says the same thing. And it says something similar to this. Failure to request a continuance of a summary judgment hearing precluded review of issue whether defendants have reasonable time to complete their discovery prior to the hearing of the motion. In this case, even if you can construe the, the comments at the uh, summary judgment hearing indicating that there was some discovery which remained as a request for continuance, there was no, there was no affidavit ever filed explaining what the relevance of this discovery was. There was no information provided as to what attempts had been made to procure the discovery. Um, in fact, in their brief, they state, you know, there was a payment history that they wanted, but then they readily admit that Sonova says that they don't have the history. Um, there, there's no testimony. There was nothing provided to the trial court or even subsequent that was sworn that said, why is this evidence relevant? Does it exist? This was the failure to have, it's not the result of an inexcusable delay, there was nothing. Um, and so I think that that was an important consideration um, that this court uh, should consider. So absent any questions from the panel, Thank you, I will conclude. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, may it please the court. Just to touch on a, a few points that were made before the, you know, with respect to 70103 and 70104, um, you know, we cited one case in our brief, the Cheshire versus Magna Carta Inc. case, the, the second DCA case from 1987. And, and it stands for the proposition that the, the court may not grant summary judgment on any extraneous matters or any matters that are not set forth in the movement summary judgment motion. And all of the all of the briefing about 70103, 70104, and uh, the discussion today, it, it all falls under that category because the, the court entertained you know, these issues. But again, the, the, the statutes which were directly on point were not cited by Sinovis in their motion. I mean, the only motion that they, or excuse me, the only case or authority they cited for a legal proposition about duty, you know, related to, um, you know, I believe it was a, a city and it didn't you know, involve two different banks or uh, a refinancing transaction. So, you know, from our perspective, this line of cases would govern and would require a reversal because the court you know, entertained argument and decided, I mean, the motion for summary judgment is very clear on one of these bases of duty, finding no duty under the statute, the statute didn't apply was you know, one of these matters that was not kind of briefed by uh, Sonovus in its motion. Also, um, in the Wills versus Sears Roebuck case, I believe that's a Florida Supreme Court case, that that case makes it clear that uh, you know, on summary judgment, it is Sonovus's duty to unequivocally show that there was you know, no negligence in this case. We, we believe that they failed to do that. The statute, so you, and, and I was reading this uh, Washington tool versus Shelton, and you know, it seems like it was trying to consider wiggle room about who, who, who would bring the action as the employees of its junior. I mean, in order to be, if you're the mortgagor or a person who has already paid an outstanding mortgage in the judgment, you actually need a statute, apparently, to, to bring a cause of action. 
to require satisfaction. But your client's not even a mortgage or, or a person who has full paid an outstanding mortgage. And you're saying that this statute somehow converts the, the duty to your client? It sets forth the and again, one of the issues again that the court decided um, without you know without having you know Snow was having moved for it was the fact that the court decided that this was a standalone private cause of action that we should have brought instead of our cause of action for negligence. For um, obviously, we did not bring a statutory cause of action; we brought a cause of action in negligence. And and as I mentioned too, yeah, the you know cause of action for negligence may be caused by somebody you know. You know, running through a, a red light or a stop sign, and there's a statute that forbids that. But you don't necessarily need to plead that statute in your complaint when you, you know, when you plead that uh, an individual committed uh, vehicular negligence against you. The, the the law doesn't require that. I guess they're just trying to figure out who who is U.S. Bank in this scenario. U.S. Bank is the in generic terms. Yes, I mean they're the they're not a mortgage or they're the mortgagee. Of the 2006 right. mortgage, and and again going back to the so Shelton what, case, what do you, what do these out? Well, we believe that under the language of 70104, it's very clear that it's broad and that it protects the uh, the public records and that it would include encompass mortgages as well, um, because obviously if there's a satisfaction of a prior loan that would protect a, a subsequent lender and and their priority. And this is an issue of priority. And that of course flows into the statute of limitations issue too, because you know, when Sonovus Bank you know, received full payment of its loan, its loan was paid zero. The statute requires that they pay it off. Our closing instructions said, you know, our loan you know, proceeds should only be dispersed if there's, uh, you know, if we have priority. There's no other uh, other lenders out there. Um, you know, at, at that point in time, you know, Sonovus had a duty to pay off. And satisfy that mortgage of record. And without doing that, then there's a question of priority because then you have two mortgages of record. And it wasn't until and unless you know our mortgage, you know, the, the trust or appellant's mortgage, it wasn't until our mortgage was extinguished in the 2015 foreclosure case that that priority issue was established. The Brian of the Rat case. Yes. So for those reasons and the reasons that we uh, uh, detail more closely in our briefs, uh, we believe that the summary judgment order should be reversed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Our final case this morning is Progressive Select.